Imagine that you are the great Roman architect, Apollodorus of Damascus, and a time vortex whisks you to Great Britain in 1825, where you are dumbfounded by how the country's builders are using a new material unknown to you that they call cast iron to build what at first glance appears to you as impossible buildings and bridges. Being a Roman, you are, of course, curious to learn about this material so that you can incorporate it into your own designs. In this lecture, we are going to explore the impact that the introduction of iron construction has had on architecture. In the last lecture, we saw how the French had begun to incorporate iron to reinforce masonry structures. However, these experiments had been stopped for almost a decade by the social unrest brought on by the French Revolution. While I started with France, I don't want you to get the idea that the French were the first, because the British were also experimenting with iron construction at this time, as we shall see today. But there will be a significant difference in how the French built with iron and how the British used iron in their structures. For as I have been trying to demonstrate, the French and the British will usually take different approaches to everything in life and iron construction will be no different. The French iron we have seen so far was comprised of individually customized pieces that were hand wrought or hand crafted by blacksmiths. The British are going to naturally gravitate to industrial made interchangeable repetitive parts that are mass produced. For it was in Great Britain that the Industrial Revolution followed the scientific revolution that we discussed in the last lecture. We should see the impact of these revolutions manifest itself in the materials used as well as in the architecture itself. But first we need to confront how the Industrial Revolution is going to impact you as an architect. The question is quite straightforward. How would the making of buildings be influenced by these following developments during the Industrial Revolution? By structural engineering? By iron and glass? By steam power? By electric power and lighting? And eventually, of course, by the computer? As an example, there is quite a difference between pre-modern St. Paul's Cathedral and the Crystal Palace, is there not? And this difference is not limited only to their exterior form, but also to the experience of their interior space as well, yes? Because never before did one standing inside a building have the possibility to be directly connected with the outside until now, because the amount of glass that was now possible allowed one a direct visual connection with what was on the other side of the wall, be it a forest or a crystal blue sky. It will take less than a hundred years from the publication of Lauget's Primitive Hut, where Lauget told the young architect to look away from the stone architecture of the past and instead look to nature for inspiration, to erect the Crystal Palace for the 1851 World's Fair. I found this particularly poignant image of the interior of the Crystal Palace, and I wanted to juxtapose it with Lauget because with iron and glass, nature can even be inside of architecture. And it's going to be in Great Britain, not Lauget's France, where the Industrial Revolution is going to take hold. There are a lot of reasons for this that I don't have the time to discuss, so all I can do is refer you to a number of excellent books on the topic. But the fact of the matter is that Britain's society, politics, and culture were such that the Industrial Revolution took off in Great Britain. The British will be the leading power during the second half of the 19th century, especially once Queen Victoria ascends the throne and gives the kingdom stability with the 70 years of her reign. This was similar to what we saw France experience under Louis XIV, when you have a monarch who first of all is good and then reigns for a very long period, your society is going to flourish during that time. We are interested in cast iron, which is one of the industrial secrets that allows Britain to lead the world at this moment. The development of British cast iron is associated with Abraham Darby, an ironmonger who has a factory at Colebrookdale in western central England. He picked a perfect location for his foundry, 
as it is on the Severn River, which he can use for transportation. It was also positioned near both iron and coal fields. The story revolves around the need for cooking utensils, because until Darby comes up with a secret process for cast iron, a poor lower class person would be lucky to own one pot to cook with, which was usually a brass pot, usually from Holland. For some reason, the Dutch knew how to make brass pots cheaper than anybody else, but they were still expensive to the point where you were lucky to have a brass pot in which to cook. This potential market was the incentive for Darby to try and find the material with which he could mass produce pots for everybody so you could afford to have more than one. Meanwhile, the British have pretty much deforested the island for fuel as well as for the Navy, creating an energy crisis. The British turned to coal for fuel, and someone soon discovered that if they put coal through a process similar to that of burning wood to make charcoal, which is called coking, the process not only burns the impurities out of the coal, but also results in a sufficient heat that actually melts iron, which then allows you to pour it into a mold so that you can mass produce a million pieces of the same object if you wish. And the rest is history, of course. But don't tell anybody outside of the island, for this secret will give the British a significant technological advantage for the first 20 years of this invention. So Abraham Darby and Colebrook Dale are the names we associate with the invention of cast iron. So on the left we have the French blacksmith making a single piece a day, where Abraham Darby over here on the right is cranking out a hundred pieces a day. So there are going to be some differences between these two processes at the beginning of cast iron construction. One of the advantages that the French handmade technique has is that British cast iron by itself doesn't have the same strength and tension as it does in compression. You could make the analogy that cast iron is, in this way, similar to stone, and therefore, like stone, cast iron is relatively weak in tension, meaning that it cannot span very far as a horizontal beam. The old-fashioned French hand-forged iron was superior in tension, and therefore, the early French iron structures could be built with a slightly longer span than the early British cast iron structures. The first recorded use of cast iron in a British building is usually associated with the evolution of factories, but no British capitalist prior to 1790 would have been interested in spending the money needed to use cast iron. Actually, the first recorded British building that used cast iron is this small parish church in Liverpool, St. Anne's, erected in 1770, where cast iron columns were used to support the organ loft because they were smaller in diameter than masonry ones. With this first example, the difference between the French use of iron and the British is quite apparent. While the French are embedding iron elements within traditional masonry, the British are using iron as freestanding objects. By 1775, Darby's grandson, Abraham Darby III, has grown the business to the point that it needed more space for expansion, which obviously was available directly across the river. So they needed to build a bridge over the Severn River, and eventually someone in the company says, hey, let's use cast iron rather than stone for it. So this is what resulted from the search for a bridge at Colebrookdale, which is the first engineering landmark of the Industrial Revolution. It's still there today, having just been restored. With iron, it's already spanning 100 feet. In other words, the first structure that uses this new material is already two-thirds of the way to beating the record held for over 1,600 years by the concrete dome of the Roman Pantheon. The evolution of the design of the bridge is quite an interesting story because this is what would have been built if stone had been used. This bridge was built only 20 years before the Colebrookdale Bridge. The circles are used to reduce the weight while raising the elevation of the roadbed. I was really happy to find this slide a couple of years ago because it actually shows how they built stone bridges prior to Colebrookdale. And that explains this design that had been done for the Colebrookdale Bridge by an architect. Remember, innovation is a two-step process. 
Few, if anyone, is smart enough to do both required steps at the same time. Here is the first step then, the new material being used in the traditional technique. The architect, Pritchard, has designed a good stone arched bridge with the exception of proposing to make the voussoirs in cast iron. Fortunately, Darby's grandson had a good friend by the name of John Wilkinson, who was known as the Iron Master. Wilkinson was an iron fanatic and had built a house with almost everything in it made of cast iron. He took one look at Pritchard's design and kind of smirked, saying, No, iron's not lithic. It's so strong that it wants to be linear. If one takes advantage of the material's inherent characteristics, it should look and work like iron, not stone. It's the same story that we saw with the Doric order, right? Why would the Greeks copy a type of construction based on wood and simply copy it in stone as opposed to having developed a style unique to stone construction? Here are two period shots. Juxtapositions of timeless sailing boats of the past with the coming future of iron structures, along with two contemporary shots. There are five identical iron arches connected by, look at those joints, not with bolts or rivets, but with friction shims. It is the first attempt at construction with iron, so this was a standard method of putting together iron pieces using wood technology. The bridge was finished in 1781, and voila, we have the first freestanding iron structure. The term Industrial Revolution typically conjures up the image of a factory, and it would not be long before iron would be used to erect factories, but once again, I repeat, iron was expensive, and these are capitalists who are interested only in maximizing their investment, so something is going to have to force them into building with iron. So what did the early Industrial Revolution factory look like? Of course, it was built with heavy timber columns and beams, and then some type of water mill going around, which powered axles that ran through the entire space, to which one could hook up a leather belt to power a machine. Things going back and forth. Sparks of static electricity are flying. You are using oil to keep things going smooth, and of course, you are working with some type of fabric that gives off cotton dust into the air. Boom! They combust just like that. These are tinder boxes. But the owners don't care because they have insurance. And relative to construction, insurance is cheap. So that's the critical issue that finally brings about change. The same thing is going to happen again in the United States and Chicago after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It's not going to be the contractors. It's not going to be the owners. It's not even going to be the architects who change construction and architecture. It will be the insurance companies when they finally get burned once too many times. And finally, someone's going to say, wait a minute, how could we have been so stupid? So it will be in England where the insurance companies bring a change in factory construction. The issue will come to a head with this factory the Albion Flour Mill, built in London in 1786. In an effort to get publicity, the owners invested a large sum of money in regards to its architecture. It was just not another cheap building or factory. They even put it in London, as opposed to in the country, in order to generate public investment in their project. They had the biggest steam engine ever built by James Watt at the time. It took less than five years for this showpiece to go up in flames in 1791. This time, the insurance companies involved were forced into bankruptcy as they didn't have the funds needed to rebuild the building. There was no regulatory agency, so everybody got burned. The practice was that an owner would build a cheap building and insure it with a cheaper policy. Therefore, there was no incentive to build well or even try to when you could just pass the liability off to an insurance company. The gamble for both sides usually paid off until this fire. Finally, the companies got together and realized how stupid they had been. They raised the rates on typical wood construction with the admonition 
you better find a better way of constructing factories if you want these rates to come down. This was open market capitalism at its best. So it's not surprising then that the very next year, 1792, we get the first use of iron structures in a factory. It's now less expensive to build with iron than it is to pay the high insurance rates for wood structures. You don't really need to know what this building is or who the builder is, other than the British now are starting to develop multi-story iron framing, that is iron columns first and then eventually with iron beams. This particular building, however, is the first one with iron columns. Note it still has a heavy timber beam, which is as fireproof as unprotected iron, because timber will char first, which creates a protective layer of insulation that typically protects the rest of the inner wood from the heat of the fire. In the upper right image, you can see the evolution of iron framing, so that by 1800, we have cast iron beams as well as columns. So it took less than eight years to completely transform the timber frame into an iron frame. The lower right image shows a typical interior of one of these factories, cast iron columns supporting cast iron beams, from which fireproof shallow brick arches span to support the floor above. The columns have a cruciform or cross-shaped cross-section at this time because it can be cast easier than a hollow circular column. The problem with the hollow section was the core and the mold. It was very hard to keep it centered while the hot iron is being poured around it meaning that no matter how careful one was, the core was off-center, meaning you had created a weak axis that would encourage the column to buckle at a lower load than it was supposed to support. If we return to the beam sections in the upper right for a moment, note that they all have a larger bottom flange than their top flange. As I have mentioned in previous lectures, when a beam deflects under a load, it develops compression in its top and it develops tension in its bottom because it stretches as it deflects. Well, cast iron is not as strong in tension as it is in compression, so these builders had to add more iron to the tension side because the tension in the bottom is the same as the compression in the top. So if iron can't take the same pressure in tension, the beam's bottom needs more material to resist the tension, hence cast iron beams have an upside down T-shaped section, not the more modern I-beam shape of a steel beam. The upper left shows what these factories look like on the outside. They need to provide daylight and ventilation, so there are repetitive windows in the brick wall that surrounds and stiffens the iron frame. So by 1800, the British had developed a system with which they can build multi-storied, iron-framed factories, a system they will continue to refine for the next 50 years. But the real story of iron has to wait until after the defeat of Napoleon, who was trying to conquer all of Europe. The entirety of Britain had to be focused on this task, so the capital investment during this era was minimal. Fortunately, Admiral Nelson defeated him at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, which stopped his ambitions for invading England. I once came across a book by an author who made a very profound statement, I thought, which was, if Napoleon had been successful in his invasion of England, it would have set back the Industrial Revolution for at least 30 years, because the British laissez-faire system of business and science would have been substituted with the rigid French centralized system that did not encourage individual risk-taking needed to birth the Industrial Revolution. So Trafalgar had profound ramifications for European history, including its technology and its architecture. With the final defeat of Napoleon, Britain emerged as the world's superpower, and after 1815, it could get back to evolving its industrial systems and its architecture. So we enter a relatively peaceful era after Napoleon's defeat, and can now concentrate on more artistic and scientific matters. We left off with British architecture last time, with Thomas Rickman's writing the first history of English architecture in 1817, in which he attempted the first documentation of Gothic architecture. 
Note that Rickman's book was published only two years after the Battle of Waterloo. We saw that Rickman's book assisted the contemporary interest in developing a Gothic revival style. Rickman, who has just finished his book, then has a chance encounter with John Craig, an ironmonger, and the two of them form a company to make prefabricated cast iron Gothic revival churches. In other words, first they will fabricate just the interior structure that will be surrounded with a stone exterior, but eventually the entire building, interior as well as exterior will be cast iron. They simply manufacture the pieces, put them on a barge, and float them down the river. So they can deliver to you an ornamented High Gothic Revival church for pennies of what it used to cost in stone. So once again, it was the churches, really, where cast iron started to be refined and then eventually became affordable to be used in the factories. The first piece of serious architecture, because Rickman's exact copying of Gothic details can hardly qualify as being architecture, is the Royal Pavilion at Brighton of 1815. Again, you can see with Napoleon's final defeat, we can finally get back to building after all this warfare. This is the summer resort for the royal family at the Oceanside Resort of Brighton. Architect John Nash was commissioned to design it. Interestingly, for the warmer climate of Brighton, he has chosen to celebrate the expansion of the empire into India by giving the building an Indian-inspired design. We are interested in the fact that Nash made it completely out of iron. The exterior where cast iron's ability to produce ornate shapes inexpensively helped to keep the cost down, which was critical coming as it did after a very expensive war. But more importantly for us, he also used it in the interior, not only for the same reason, but also because, like what we saw Soufflot experimenting with space in St. Genevieve, as iron is stronger, there is going to be much less structural material. But more importantly now, we're going to be able to see the increase of transparency within the interior of a building. In other words, as you don't have to make everything solid anymore because iron is so much stronger, you can be linear in configuration rather than monolithic. For example, look at the stairs with their open treads. So the use of iron structures will start bringing in space or openness and light into interiors. Landscape architect Humphrey Repton was the first British designer to understand the impact that glass and iron is going to have on the interior perception of a building. He is the fourth of the British landscape architects that I have mentioned earlier, going back to the issue that it was the landscape architects who brought us into this modern aesthetic. For the vast majority of building architects weren't interested in it because for them, architecture was, of course, classical ornament. So what I find interesting is that landscape architects don't have any investment in any type of ornament, be it classical, gothic, or whatever. In fact, they are going to see ornament as their enemy. For when you're designing a greenhouse, that ornament can easily block out some of the daylight needed for the propagation of the plants. Repton is a well-known landscape architect that I want to introduce you to. He designed the greenhouses at the Brighton Pavilion for the royal family. They were very passively designed with a northern masonry wall with the glass on the south that allows the sun to come in and heat up the thermal mass of the floor and in the wall so it then re-radiates it into the space at night. There are operable windows for ventilation. Without steam heat, this has to be passively workable, right? Because it's got to propagate plants without any artificial power. If you really want to study how to work with nature, i.e. if you're interested in sustainable architecture, you need to go back to the early 19th century and study how they did it because they had to do it without any type of artificial power. In 1816, Repton wrote a paper in which he nailed what is to come. 
called Fragments on the Theory and Practice of Landscape Gardening, which again doesn't really have an architectural title, but that doesn't matter because in these two images he is showing you where architecture and interior design is at 1800 and where it was going to go with this new language of iron and glass. And so he writes an essay called Parlor's Formal Gloom. I'm going to read it to you now just to emphasize the forward thinking that this guy has. No more the cedar parlor's formal gloom with dullness chills. There are no people in that first image in the upper left, are there? He's very clever, the spin he puts on this issue, contrasting between the dull old architecture of the past, where he puts no people so as to make it seem as bleak as possible, and the coming future where the people are having a wonderful time in the lower right. No more the cedar parlor's formal gloom with dullness chills. Tis now the living room. Note the change in name from parlor to living room. Where guests to whim or taste or fancy true, scattered in groups, their different plans pursue. Here politicians eagerly relate the last day's news or the last night's debate and there are lovers ch conquered by checkmate. Here books of poetry and books of prints furnish aspiring artists with new hints. Flowers, landscapes, figures crammed into one portfolio, their blend discordant tints to form an oleo, while discords twanging from the half-tuned harp make dullness cheerful, changing flat to sharp. Here, midst exotic plants, the curious made of Greek and Latin seems no more afraid. Their lounging bows and bells enjoy their folly, nor less enjoying learned melancholy. Silent midst crowds, the doctor here looks big, wrapped in his own importance and his wig. Repton has broken the box. This is what we call it, for we've been living in boxes for the last two thousand years. Glass and iron are going to give us space after space after space that continues to infinity. Repton shows all of these spaces with blue sky and daylight. Everyone is cheery. It is beautiful in the future. Humphrey Repton has destroyed the box in 1816. Note that date. But of course, change is a two-step process, so the actual design of the room in the future still has all the decoration of the past. Somebody else is going to have to take up the second step and design it with a new language. And this will come from another British landscape architect. In an earlier lecture, I said that the English garden would exhibit three modern tendencies. The garden had the free flow of asymmetry, the garden had Gothic revival follies, and the third thing of modernism it had was the greenhouse. Greenhouses have been around since 1700. The function of these first ones on these large country estates was to propagate food for the aristocrats who lived there. You bring back an orange tree from some exotic location in the empire, and you try to propagate it. Then you have oranges in the midst of winter. That is the purpose of these buildings. Here are some turn-of-the-century designs, and you can see that the primary design parameter is to maximize the amount of glass, and therefore minimize the amount of shade produced by worthless pieces like ornament, so that the plants could get as much sun as possible, especially in merry old sunny England. So ornament, I should say decoration, is the enemy for a designer of a greenhouse, i.e. a landscape architect. This is the guy we're looking for, John Claudius Luden, who is another landscape architect. The landscape architects are all trying to understand how to design greenhouses to make them as best as possible. In 1817, he writes a paper in which he displays his design for a greenhouse that addresses the problem of using a semicircular dome. The flatness at the top of the Iron Dome will encourage condensation that will drop down on the plants, leaving spots that will focus sunlight that can burn the leaves. 
So he's proposed to use a pointed arch to minimize the flat area at the top so that when the water condenses, gravity can easily conduct it to where it can be stored for later use. Luden, just like Rickman and Craig, starts a company to make prefabricated greenhouses. I hope this is somewhat shocking to you. That is, we're talking about prefabricated iron buildings in the early 1800s, that it's not something that developed only after World War II. Luden designs a house for himself where he can show a potential client all of his different systems. He can make a walk through the house pointing out, well, here we can do a dome, or like this we can do a wall, or we have these kind of fabricated pieces that we can do this or that with. The one thing that Luden is really famous for is ridge and furrow glazing. Rather than just having a smooth surface of glass, what he will do is to tilt the glass up to catch the morning sun earlier and also to hold the sunset as late as possible in order to try to get as much of the daylight into the space. Ridge and furrow glazing also drains itself much better than a flat piece of glass. In 1817, he writes an essay titled Remarks on Hothouses, in which he makes, for me anyway, some claims that were absolutely unbelievable at this time. Quote, We are now able to exhibit spring and summer in the midst of winter, because of steam heating, and so have such a proud control over nature, do you feel the energy crisis is on its way? Because we now finally have technology that with steam power, we no longer need to work with nature anymore? I don't need to worry about the cold. All I need to do is to pump up the steam heat. So what he says is that sooner or later, schools, markets, theaters, and churches are going to be made out of this iron and glass material that he is using to build greenhouses. So in 1817, he's predicting exactly what we needed Repton to do the previous year. For it only takes one year from when Repton showed how to open up the interior of a building, but he was still using the ornament from the past, to 1817, when Luden questions, why are we still copying the old way of building? The other thing that Luden predicts is that we will be able to cover entire cities with glass and iron. Why do we want to live in a city when it's winter time, when we can cover it with a greenhouse and stay warm and dry? He is already predicting what Bucky Fuller will propose for New York City 150 years later. So Luden's there. He's in the future. He understands the future of architecture. He sees it. For our purposes, Luden starts the clock ticking in 1817. Quote, A new style of architecture which may be beautiful without exhibiting any of the orders of Greek or Gothic design. Unquote. Modernism is born and we're off and running. We no longer need to copy the architecture of the past. So this is what I mean by saying that progress is a two-step process. Rickman constructed traditional Gothic churches using cast iron. Repton also was using the new material in a traditional form, but did show us what might be possible. But it will be Luden, within a year later, who gives us the future and neither of these three were an architect. We have one historian and two landscape architects, all telling us where architecture is going to go in the future. The 1820s and 30s will see the continued development of the British greenhouse. This surviving one is in Exeter. It's not freestanding yet, for there is a north wall of masonry for added stability, and mass to absorb and re-radiate the heat at night, as well as to reduce the surface area of the glass to reduce heat loss. Here you can see how the designer has responded to the small size of glass panels that were produced at this time. He starts at the top, and as the ribs radiate out, he introduces more of them to keep the spacing the same as one gets farther and farther away from the center. <laughs> 
Here you can see that each pane of glass is slightly bowed to the center for added strength and do you try to keep the draining water away from the edge of the glass at the rim where it can leak. Here is the Brenton Hall Conservatory designed by Luden in 1827. Note there are no walls. It is a completely freestanding iron and glass greenhouse. It spans over 100 feet with nothing more than just sash bar. There are no structural ribs. Unbelievable. Unfortunately, it was only a matter of time before it began to twist, and once it did, it simply twisted itself into the ground. There still is a need for some type of lateral bracing in these structures. Nonetheless, look at the natural passive qualities of this structure. There are vents at the foundation, and at mid-height, and at its top. There also most likely would be a solar awning that is supported at the center ring of vents and would extend down to the foundation. Here is the glass menagerie built in 1830 at the Surrey Zoological Gardens. In the center image, you can see the solar awning that these buildings typically had to reduce solar gain, and it's obvious that it must be a shady day because the shade has been gathered up. Joseph Paxton, I think, is one of the coolest dudes of the 19th century. He was born poor. He worked his way up by learning how to manage a garden. He eventually will be hired by the Duke of Devonshire, who just happens to have the largest estate in Great Britain to run his gardens. And with this guy's money, Paxton builds the really first major greenhouse, the Great Conservatory at Chatsworth Garden in 1836. On the right, they are building it. This building is a football field long, so glass and iron architecture is here to stay. I want you to appreciate the fact that this is a natural system. It has a cistern in its basement. All the columns are hollow so that when it rains, the water is collected and channeled down the columns to where it is stored. But it's not all iron. Surprise! That's one of the secrets of Paxton's work. While the columns and the beams are cast iron, the major arched spans are glue lamb wood arches. First, wood kept the cost down, and second, Britain simply does not have the capacity to fabricate so much iron. It would have taken much longer if he had used iron arches. We are going to see that this secret is going to save the 1851 Crystal Palace. That is, Paxton's common sense ability to merge the good qualities of iron with that of glue laminated wood. The glass used to enclose it is Luden's ridge and furrow glazing. All the iron members at this time are pin connected or otherwise hinged, meaning the structure needs triangulation or some other geometric rigidity. And in this case, Paxton has terminated each end of the building by placing half arches perpendicular to the axis of the space and leaned them up against the last arch as a buttress. These black and white slides, however, just don't do it justice because all of the iron is going to be painted white. Why? Why? Because white reflects as much light as possible to aid in the propagation of the plants. So put yourself in the structure with the green plants and the white structure and the blue sky outside. I want you to appreciate these buildings as really colorful, light-filled, fun spaces, especially during the winter in London, right? The following year, Victoria ascends the throne to begin her reign, and eight years later, she travels to Chatsworth, as British monarchs did to show the flag throughout the realm. In 1846, it's just a great story. The Chatsworth Conservatory is all set up for the royal visit. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert are slowly pulled in a carriage pulled by two horses down the central aisle. The conservatory is all lit with candles. It's a magical fairyland, and she wants her own one. It's just that simple. This gives us the Royal Conservatory at Kew Gardens. 
and you can see the similarities and the differences. Richard Turner, a Scottish ironmonger, is the right guy at the right spot and the right time. He just knows how to market his business. As soon as he gets word that the Queen has visited Chatsworth and wants her own version, he designs a model, shows up at court within a week, and says, Your Majesty, this is what you really want to build, and he gets the job. The difference is that Turner is going to use all iron as opposed to Paxson's use of wood arches. But you see basically the same configuration as that of Chatsworth's. Arches spanning the main axis, pin connected to the ground, again requiring buttressing at each end by rotated half arches, all ridge and furrow glazing. Of course it must be longer than the Duke's greenhouse. This is now 360 feet long. Once again, that's longer than a football field, and I remind you of that just to keep you uh, aware of the scale of these 19th century buildings. However, unlike Chatsworth, its highest section doesn't extend the building's entire length, which was done in order to keep the cost down, remembering he used no wood. It was recently restored, and I just lucked out on a Saturday when I showed up on the only day I had open in London, and I hit it on a picture-perfect day with the blue sky and the green plants, and it had just been painted. So this is what they really looked like. I want to point out this ladder that's on a railing so that they can keep the glass clean. So you can climb back and forth and up and down so you can keep that glass clean and sparkling. Similar to Chatsworth, rainwater comes down the glass to a gutter that runs around the edge and gathers all the water and takes it to an underground cistern for storage to be used at a later time. Take a few moments to look at the exterior details. This is what it really looks like inside. On a sunny day there is the blue sky and the light-colored iron structure, and the green plants. I'm setting you up to understand and appreciate how cool it's going to be in the Crystal Palace in just five years from now. Nothing like this has ever existed before, so I need you to appreciate how radically different these greenhouses are compared to traditional buildings like St. Paul's. Now, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Far from it. However, one cannot deny that anything like this has ever been built before. So the British have perfected what I call these little gems, or crystals in the park. The photo at the upper left is just perfect of how these structures were originally conceived as romantic escapes from reality. But these buildings are only for rich people and their exotic plants, right? No commoner would be allowed to come near these early greenhouses unless they were employees. However, the one thing that you don't see in these photos, which is conveniently left off, is where is the smokestack? For this building is heated, isn't it? The smokestack is some 600 feet downwind and the chimney is located in a forest so that you don't see the chimney and its smoke that is supporting this wonderfully romantic image in the winter. Instead, if you look just a little to the left, you see that the forest is puffing smoke from the coal being burned. There is definitely a sense of detachment from reality in these early greenhouses. So we have seen in England that the aristocracy, that is the rich people, have been building these gems on their estates for their plants. Meanwhile, what's been happening in France after the fall of Napoleon? For, eventually, the French are going to get their act together and start building again. To continue this lecture, you will need to listen to Lecture 18.2.